Hello, this is Angela, one of the hosts of Journeys of Hope, and I'm standing here on the grounds of Pilgrim Center of Hope. Guiding people on Journeys of Hope is our passion, and as a nonprofit organization, we couldn't do it without you. Today, I'd like to thank our generous sponsor who made this podcast possible in honor of Valentin, Nicholas, and Francisco Campos. Journeys of Hope, an introduction to the universal church that promotes an attitude of pilgrimage among the faithful by introducing you to pilgrim destinations around the world. Welcome to Journeys of Hope, your passport to sacred destinations around the world. This program, produced by Pilgrim Center of Hope, provides you with a virtual pilgrimage to all the places associated with the history of our church and written about in Scripture. For the last 26 years, Pilgrim Center of Hope has led over 75 authentic spiritual pilgrimages to the Holy Land, Italy, France, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Germany, Marian apparition sites, and beyond. As a result, Journeys of Hope is able to take you to these holy sites so that you can experience what it is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, the Apostles, and numerous saints. Welcome to this program. I'm Mary Jane Fox. Our programs are available on podcast and also at our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. If you're new to the program, I invite you to take a look at our Journeys of Hope archive library, which contains all previous episodes of the show. And when you go there, there are four categories that you can choose from the Holy Land, the Saints, Marian, and Local, so that you can go to each category and see the numerous listings of the programs. Pilgrim Center of Hope is an evangelization apostolate, and our mission is guiding people to Christ and the Church. So learn more about us and our very unique ministry, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. You know, as Catholics, we are rich in having so many places we call our very own because they are related to our faith and our history. You can listen anytime to Journeys of Hope on our website and on our podcast to learn more about our faith and our history as well. Well, in today's episode of Journeys of Hope, we journey to the House of Mary in Ephesus. Today, we will learn about this incredible ancient city that was once the second largest in the world and where John the Apostle took Mary, the Mother of God, to live after Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven. We will visit her home John built for her in Ephesus and receive insights on how we can build a little home for Mary in our houses. Where is Ephesus? Well, Ephesus is a very important site to both Christians and Muslims, and it is on the west coast of Turkey. The home of the Blessed Virgin Mary is to believe to be here in Ephesus, where she lived her last few years of her life on earth. And let me spell the word Ephesus, because it's a very unique word. It's E-P-H-E-S-U-S. Ephesus was once the trade center of the ancient world and a religious center of early Christianity. And today, Ephesus is an important tourist center in Turkey. Well, the ruins of Ephesus we see today are mostly from the first century before Christ was born, and it was the largest city, as I said, outside Rome. It was a Greek city, home of the famous philosophers and of Greek philosophers, and the temple of a Greek god named Artemis. So, though Ephesus now lies in ruins, it was once the largest, largest and wealthiest cities in the ancient world. It was near a shipping port on the Aegean Sea, which is only a few miles down the road, probably about 10 miles. It had about 250,000 citizens and attracted a steady stream of visitors to its temples and its various things that they offered during that time period. So in those days, uh, Ephesus offered various forms of entertainment, a government, market, and medical needs. You can imagine how it was at that time. 
There were impressive stone buildings lining its streets, huge stones that made the pavement smooth for chariots and, and, and individuals to walk up and down, a huge amphitheater and a stadium for gladiator games, which kept the population pretty much entertained. Well, in the first century of Christianity, Christians were living in Ephesus. When we think of biblical lands, the nation of Turkey, which straddles Europe and Asia, rarely comes to mind. Yet, as a major center for the early church, this ancient land is home to many sites sacred to the Christian faith. Two-thirds of the books in the New Testament were either written in Asia Minor which is an older term for the Asian portion of Turkey today, or were addressed to communities there. See, the apostles John, Paul, and Peter lived, preached, and prayed in Asia Minor. And the seven books mentioned in the book of Revelation, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, are located on or near Turkey's Asian coast. Now, of all of these cities, Ephesus is the most famous, and today it is one of Christianity's greatest pil great pilgrimage destinations. Now, the Apostle Paul lived and did missionary work in Ephesus for two years, and the Apostle John and Mary, the mother of God, lived there in the last decades of their lives. Let's talk a little bit about St. Paul's time in Ephesus. And there's so much to be said here, but just to briefly introduce his time in Ephesus. When Paul came to this cosmopolitan city, it was around the year 53. It was already home to a small Christian community, making it a natural base for his missionary work. Uh, the Christians there were not in hiding. They were living as normal citizens of Ephesus. But his passionate preaching eventually stirred up controversy in the city particularly among the artisans who crafted these miniature versions of the pagan gods to sell to people who went in and out of the city. Well, the story of what happened next is actually recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, when a silversmith named Demetrius heard there was a man, that was Paul, in the city saying that gods made by humans were not gods at all and should not be worshipped. He realized then that his livelihood was at stake. So what did he do? He and his fellow artisans found some of Paul's followers and organized a protest against them. It created a scene that threatened to turn violent. The biblical story concludes with Paul leaving Ephesus. However, Christianity continued to, draw, to thrive in Ephesus. Well, as time went on, Ephesus was destroyed first in the 3rd century by the Goths, rebuilt, and destroyed again by an earthquake. But in the last 150 years, the large-scale excavations that have been done uh, have revealed the grandeur of Ephesus. Truly, it is a place of mystery. My husband, Deacon Tom, and I have led a couple of pilgrim groups there. We have been there a few times. And each time, we learn new insights of this incredible place, so deep and rich is its history. We mentioned earlier that Ephesus is where Mary's home was located and where she lived the last few years of her life. Now, the question is, well, why and how did Mary even get to Ephesus? Well, she arrived at Ephesus with St. John, who was called the Beloved Disciple and lived in the first century until the later years of life. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he had given John, the beloved disciple who stood at the foot of the cross, his mother. He told John, Behold your mother. And he told his mother, Behold your son. And this can be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Soon after Jesus' resurrection, uh, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, severe persecution of the Christian church began in Jerusalem. Well, according to historians and church tradition, the disciple John took Mary into his care, as directed by Jesus from the cross, and brought her to Ephesus to avoid the persecutions of Christians in Jerusalem. Now, we are unable to find 
we well, we Tom and I were un, were unable to find the true documentation on how they traveled. However, we do know that there would be two ways to reach Ephesus from Jerusalem, either by sea or by land. Let's look at both. Ancient Palestine is by the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so that's where would, they would have started from Jerusalem. You can, by boat, cross travel uh, across um, the, Mediter- the Mediterranean Sea, traveling northward, and reach the Aegean coast of Turkey. Ephesus is located only 10 miles from the coastline. Now, by land, picture a map in your mind of ancient Palestine. Now, travel to the north into Syria, then cross into Turkey and travel westward until you reach the coast of the Aegean Sea, where Ephesus is located. If they have taken this journey, John, um, John would have taken this journey to Mary, with Mary to Ephesus, they would have traveled by camel with caravans, and it would have taken weeks for the journey. Just to give you an idea, well, this is an approximately 650 to 700 mile trip. So imagine by caravan how long that would have taken. Now, John was the first of the 12 apostles to visit Ephesus, and he began to preach the good news there. The first Christian community in Ephesus was established by John, and he became the leader of that community. Now, Mary herself did not live in the city of Ephesus, but in the country near it, only a couple of miles from the city. Her house was on a hill that sloped steeply, and when driving up the hill, well, today we drive up the hill, you can see the city of Ephesus in the distance. So what was, what was Ephesus like at the time John and Mary arrived? From what we understand and research, John and Mary lived as normal citizens of, of that area. They were not in hiding or fear of losing their lives. Remember, Ephesus was a very large, active business district to service the massive amounts of goods arriving or departing from the man-made harbor nearby and from the caravans that traveled the ancient royal road, which today you can see part of that road. As we said earlier, Ephesus was at the time second only to Rome as a cosmopolitan center of culture and commerce. There was always a heavy flow of traffic. And the Asian coast climate was similar to that of the Mediterranean countries. Depending on the time of the year, you have cool evenings, nice sunny, breezy days, even though the sun is out. When it, during the hot season, yes, the sun can be blurring, very hot, but it's a dry heat. It was a dry climate. Even though it's close to the coast, because of its location, Ephesus was uh, further like upward from the coast, there was still a breeze. So John built a home for Mary on this large hill in the country, not too far from Ephesus, and archaeologists have testified that the foundation of the home dates back to the first century, and the current house has been restored. However, we also have a lot from a woman who was a visionary. Her name was Sister Anne Catherine Emmerich. You might have heard of her. She lived in Europe in the early 1800s. She was given visions of the life of Jesus and of Mary. So she is called a visionary. Now, let me explain what that means. Okay, a visionary is someone who receives visions and apparitions as part of a personal or private revelation. However, be careful, there are many false visions and apparitions and false visionaries. It is essential to carefully discern the spirit that is the source behind these visions or apparitions. Is it the Holy Spirit, uh, the human spirit, or possibly even an evil spirit? Such people must submit themselves to the authority of of Holy Mother Church and be obedient to her, even if what she, through her representatives, who are the bishops and priests, contradict the messages of the visions. A true visionary will obey without question. If it is truly of God, nothing will stop it. An obedient visionary is a patient one, trusting that if the visions are of God, that God will remove any obstacles to the message. Disobedience to the church is a clear sign of a false visionary. An authentic visionary will always obey the legitimate church authority. Now, Anne Catherine Emmerich 
was beatified by Pope John Paul II in October of 2004, so the Church has recognized Sister Anne Catherine's insights as being authentic. And this is the result of a lot of time of study and researching her life and credibility. Now, let's just take a look at her visions. Her, in Anne Catherine Emmerich's visions, she saw the House of Mary in detail. This was all noted and, of course, documented. She had never been to Ephesus, and at that time, excavation work had not started, so it was not widely known as it is today. A priest who knew of Catherine, uh, of Anne Catherine published a book with her visions 57 years after her death. Well, this priest and another priest who knew of Anne Catherine and her writings took it upon themselves to go and find this place in Ephesus. Well, they did find the House of Mary, as she described it in every detail. What was destroyed through time was the fireplace that was part of Mary's kitchen. They brought archaeologists, and the evidence showed that indeed this little house they saw dated from the 6th century, but the foundations were from the 4th century. So, again, knowing that this was authentic, this gives testimony that this house was truly the house of Mary, well, according to, again, the revelation and the vision of of Anne Catherine, but that in the 6th century it was restored by the Christians who were living in that area. In fact, many secular resources about Ephesus refer to Catherine and Catherine's visions as being part of the story of Ephesus. Even non-Christian resources refer to her visions of Mary's house in Ephesus as being authentic. I found that very interesting. So, let's take a look at the house of Mary. Let's travel to Mary's house and return to that main road passing Ephesus to the large hill, near, the, the large hill nearby where St. John built a home for Mary. There's a huge golden statue of the Virgin Mary greeting the visitors where the road to the house of the Blessed Mother begins. The Turkish mayor of that area, who is Muslim, placed it there recently to draw even more attention of the existence of Mary's house. It's a beautiful statue. So from this point, there is about a two and a half mile distance along the winding uphill road reaching the visitor's parking lot. And along the road, there are signs in many languages providing information about the site. There are also numerous olive trees on both sides of the way leading to Mary's house. These were planted in 1898 by a group of priests from a religious community called the Lazarist. Pilgrims and tourists arriving at the House of Mary are greeted by a small statuette of Anne Catherine Emmerich and another statue of Mary. There is a special assigned parking lot for those visiting this area, and as you pass through the entrance, there's an open area and a pathway. To the left is a small cafe and eatery, and to the other side on the right are souvenir shops selling things from Turkish-made embroidered items, postcards, to religious articles such as rosaries, crosses, and statues of Mary. So then walking past the cafe and the souvenir shops, the pathway continues this flat stone pavement. Depending on the season, there's either flowers or green foliage growing along the side. Then we see a larger than life-size bronze statue of Mary. She has a crown on her head. Her hands are extended outward. The statue is facing the pathway as if saying, welcome. A few paces more, and we arrive at an open air, well, it's an open air um, sitting area where groups gather for instructions to prepare themselves to visit Mary's house. You know, this is a special place. You just don't want to, you know, get in line and walk in without really preparing oneself. This is, I believe, real important. And so this place could be also available to pray the rosary and for private reflection. And nearby this open sitting area is an outdoor altar for masses. And our pilgrim groups have had Mass there outside the House of Mary in this outdoor area. A few yards to the left, the house comes into view. The humble appearance of the small structure of stone and brick makes it seem insignificant, however consistent, with the humility of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. 
You know, this current building has been restored in the 6th century. What is original is the foundation and some lower parts. What is left today is her living room and bedroom area. The fireplace that was part of her kitchen was destroyed years ago. But we have to include here, or I should say I have to include here what Tom and I both experienced. When I first saw the House of Mary, I stood a few yards from the entrance and just looked at this very small square-shaped building. I was in awe that I was standing in front of the home where the Mother of God once lived. I was happy and I could feel my heart pump a bit faster than usual because I was becoming a bit emotional. I've always wanted to see this place since I first heard about it, and, well, here I was. And after this emotional moment, Tom and I said a prayer, asking Mary to prepare our hearts as we entered her home. We wanted to be open to receive her blessing and the blessing of her son Jesus, and we wanted to be just completely open to what, what we were to receive when we entered her home. It was an honor to be able to be there. All visitors are informed to remain silent, to respect the place, and to keep in mind that others may be praying. The house is stone and brick, a light reddish brown in color with an entrance shaped as an arch. It's not too high, about, oh, 10 feet high. There is a, a very old oak tree in front of the house. The pavement in front of the house is flat, made of stone. There's no stairs or steps. The front of the house is around 20 feet wide. If you stand to the right of the house, you can see it has an L shape. Are you ready? Let's enter, <laughs> let's enter Mary's house. Passing through the arch entrance, you can touch the 6th century stonework. And it's old. I mean, you can, and I, as I was touching it, I was thinking, how many people have been here? How many holy men and women or saints and popes, and we'll talk about that in a few moments, have been here and touched these same walls? Then we enter, we see this rectangular room about 50 feet deep with an altar on the back wall and a four-foot statue of Mary sitting on a, on a like a ledge on top of the altar, behind the altar. And it has become darkened over time because of the candles that are, are burning nearby. The room is very simple. There's no furniture. Uh, this is Mary's living room. The lighting is dim, except for the light on the altar. The original foundations of stone, remember it was from what uh, when jo St. John built it. And there's a small window to the left to the altar that brings in natural light to this area. To the left of the altar, there is an icon of Mary to see and venerate. A candle burns on the other side. Uh, the tabernacle is not there with the Blessed Sacrament, but the candle burns as a sign of the sacredness of the place, as if to tell the visitor, this is a holy place, and there's a light burning here to remind us of the sacredness. So what does one do here? What would you do? Well, as disciples of the Lord, we want to honor our Lord's mother, who is, always, who is also our mother, our Heavenly Mother. We kneel in silence, if you can kneel, because it's stone pavement, it's very hard. There's no pews. <laughs> so we kneel in silence and we speak to Mary from our heart, telling her how grateful we are to be in this holy place. It's holy because it's her home. We praise God for this opportunity to be able to visit this faraway place where so many Christians have prayed. We ask Mary to pray for us, for our intentions, and we place them in her heart here where she lived. And then a few moments of silence, and I remember taking a couple of deep breaths as if I wanted to take this entire place into my heart. I was smelling the odor of the nearby candles burning. Um, although we visited this place on a sunny day, it was warm, it was rather cool inside, and I could feel the coolness um, due to the stone walls. But we must leave. And we don't want to leave. <laughs> we want to remain here longer. I want time to look at every corner. Imagine how it was for Mary living here. So simple and so serene. Remember, this was a home on a hill away from that large city of Ephesus. We walk towards the altar and take a closer look at that dark statue of Mary. And to the right, to leave Mary's house, there's a very short pathway with a small open area on the right-hand side. 
This was once her bedroom. It was about a 12 by 12 foot area. Well, I noticed, because I wanted to grasp every detail, so I noticed in the corner there was like a little small table with an inscription from the Quran in the local language, which is Turkish. And we'll explain in a moment why this is there. Um, but as you leave her house, as we leave her house, walking to the right is a pathway to a fountain with spring water. It is called the Water of Mary. It is fresh water, and many believe it is blessed since it is believed to be the same spring Mary used when she lived here. Of course, today, they have a built, um, they built a stone wall and water outlets to collect water in bottles. And oh boy, and many pilgrims and visitors, including myself, take water as a sacramental, as holy water to bless themselves and share it with others. Can you drink from this water? Many, many people did. Um, I remember, I remember my parents when they went with us on that first pilgrimage. My father wanted. He has a great love for Mary and a great devotion to Mary. He blessed himself and he drank some of the water. And I thought, well, I don't think I'll drink, but he was fine. So, again, this was called Mary's Water Fountain. And further on the same road of the water fountain is a wall with strings where Muslims have the tradition of tying pieces of cloth as a sign of offering their intentions to Mary. Similar to us Christians who light candles in churches and chapels as a sign of a prayer, they leave these pieces of cloth tied on the string against the wall. Uh, behind her house is a path of the Stations of the Cross that Mary herself made according to tradition. Now, when she moved from Jerusalem, she could no longer walk the path of Jesus' Passion. She set up stones and markings on trees to commemorate Jesus' walk. Mary would walk along that path with the Stations of the Cross, just like she had walked it on the actual streets that Jesus had walked in Jerusalem. It was a very special devotion to her. And how do we know this? As I mentioned earlier, Anne Catherine was a visionary. The church has sanctioned her, has confirmed her writings. In fact, she is blessed. John Paul II beatified her. And so we have her writings as a as private revelation, yes, but also um, a venue for us to use for our spiritual growth, our information, our insights on the life of Jesus and Mary, because her visions were on the life of Jesus and the life of Mary. And this can be found in books today, uh, so you can read these yourself. But I have, t I am taking a few words from her, from her, actually her exact words, describing how she saw Mary build the Stations of the Cross behind her home in Ephesus. Okay, so these are her words. Behind the house, at a little distance up the hill, the Blessed Virgin had made a kind of way of the cross. When she was living in Jerusalem, she had never failed ever since our Lord's death, to follow his path to Calvary with tears of compassion. She had paced out and measured all the distances between the stations on that Via Crucis, and her love for her son made her unable to live without this constant contemplation of his sufferings. Soon after her arrival at her new home in Ephesus, I saw her every day climbing part of the way up the hill behind her house to carry out this devotion. At first, she went by herself, measuring the number of steps so often counted by her, which separated the places of our Lord's different sufferings. At each of these places, she put a stone, or if there were already a tree there, she would mark she would make a mark upon it. The way led into a large piece of wood, and upon this wood she had marked the piece of Calvary, and the grave of Christ in the little cave nearby and another hill. After she had marked this way of the cross with twelve stations, she went there with her maidservant in quiet meditation. At each station she sat down and renewed the mystery of its significance praising the Lord for his love with tears of compassion. Afterwards, she arranged the stations better, and I saw her inscribing on the stones the meaning of each station, the number of paces, and so forth. I saw, too, that she cleaned out the cave of the Holy Sepulchre and made it a place of prayer. 
At that time, I saw no picture and no fixed cross to designate the stations, nothing but plain memorial stones with inscriptions. But afterwards, as a result of constant visits and attention, I saw the place becoming increasingly beautiful and easy of approach. After the Blessed Virgin Mary's death, I saw this way of the cross being visited by Christians who threw themselves down and kissed the ground. These are the words of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich on her vision of Mary living in Ephesus. This is so interesting. Did you ever think of Mary, the mother of God, praying the Stations of the Cross? I never did until I I learned about this. We find the Stations of the Cross in just about every Catholic church. And we ourselves walk and pray the Stations of the Cross as a popular Catholic devotion. Wouldn't it be beautiful if we can increase that devotion knowing that our Mother Mary had the same devotion? You know, it was mentioned earlier that in an inscription from the Quran found in Mary's ho- was found in Mary's house. We don't know exactly what that inscription read. However, we knew that this place was also visited by Muslims. They consider Mary's house a holy place. Muslims visit this place for prayer because they honor Mary. So there could be both Christians and Muslims, tourists, visitors, people from all over the world visiting at the same time this holy place, and whatever intention that person has in their heart is the intention of the visit. For us pilgrims, for us Christians, we are there to honor and venerate Mary's house, but for the Muslims, they too come to honor Mary. According to the Quran, Mary is the mother of Jesus, who is considered a prophet. They consider Jesus a prophet. They believe to be um, a prophet, but they also consider Mary a very holy person. The name of Mary is mentioned several times in the Quran, and Mary is celebrated as a celebrated figure in the Quran, both as the mother of Jesus and as the equal of the male prophets who are found in these pages. She is the most. Uh, she Mary is the single most prominent female character in the Quran. And the Quran indicates her importance both by its portrayal of Mary as courageous and upright, the equal of her male prophetic peers. And this is pretty incredible just to know that about the Quran and Mary. So I remember when our pilgrim group had an outdoor mass outside of Mary's house, a group of Muslims came to visit the home, and as they passed our group having Mass, I could see one of them gesturing to the others to be quiet. It was a sign of respect. You know, we can attempt to build a commonality with Muslims about Mary. It is quite refreshing and positive to know of a holy place where both Christians and Muslims can pray, the, whole, the house of Mary. Perhaps this is the only place this happens. Through all our travels, uh, to hundreds of holy sites, we have never seen anything like this. So it is so easy to spend a lot of time here at the House of Mary. Pilgrims walk the path to her house. They walk around her house, touching it. They pray silently inside, visit the water fountain of Mary, and blessing themselves with the water, and perhaps some are collecting water and sharing it with others. Uh, There was that area outside her home where you can sit and ponder, maybe pray a rosary. The atmosphere is quiet, and even though there could be a line of people waiting to enter Mary's house, there is always, there is certainly a respect for the place. Oh yes, and one can visit the souvenir vendors that sell the locally handmade items and the religious articles as rose, like uh, rosaries and replicas of the statue of Mary that is found in her home. In fact, I myself have one of those small little statues in front of me now. Or, you know, perhaps enjoy a cup of coffee at the cafe. During the Turkish, um, the Turk, during the the tourist season in Turkey, which is around oh April to April, uh, April to October, they can have up to ten thousand visitors a week. Isn't that amazing? It's a lot of people visiting the House of Mary. So Ephesus is located in the Archdiocese of Izmir, which is around oh two and a, about a two hour drive, and the Archbishop of Izmir of that diocese has acknowledged the house of the Virgin Mary and has declared it truly as a pilgrimage place. So have popes visited the house of Mary? Yes, 
four popes have visited the House of Mary. The first was Pope Leo XIII in 1896, then in 1967, Pope Paul VI. John Paul II visited November 30th, 1979, and Benedict XVI, November 29th of 2006. So what is the position of the Roman Catholic Church on about the House of Mary? Well, the Church has never pronounced the authenticity of the House for lack of scientifically acceptable evidence. It has, however, from the blessing of the first pilgrimage by Pope Leo XIII in 1896, taken a positive attitude towards the site. Plus, of course, the beatification of the visionary, Sister Kat and Catherine Emmerich, who described this place so that it could be discovered. A plenary indulgence is granted to the faithful who make pilgrimage to Mary's house and satisfy all the conditions to obtain the, 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 um, the indulgence. And Pope Pius XII, in 1951, following the definition of the dogma of the Assumption of Mary to Heaven, which was to be proclaimed in 1950, elevated the house to the status of a holy place. So you can see that even though the church hasn't pronounced its authenticity, it certainly has given a, a permission for the, for the faithful, for pilgrims, for us to visit this holy site and re, truly receive graces and experience you know, in, the insights of the history which makes this home such a mysterious place. I personally believe it is the House of Mary. I mean, there's when you, you you almost feel Mary's presence when you're visiting this place, and so many people have told me that. There is a mass that is celebrated every year, which is on August the 15th, and that is the feast of the Assumption of Mary. And by the way, the custody, the Franciscans have custody of this holy site. So when you go to the House of Mary in Ephesus, you may see Franciscan uh, priests, brothers, or sisters that are actually walking around helping, assisting pilgrims, uh, or, you know, just being there for people if they have questions. Now, the Catholic Church, speaking of the Assumption of Mary, oh my gosh, there's so much here, however... Let's look at two traditions in regard to the assumption of the, of the Blessed Virgin Mary. One is that she returned to Jerusalem in her last days of her life to die where Jesus died, and from there she was assumed body and soul into heaven. The other tradition is that she died in Ephesus and was assumed body and soul to heaven from here. There has been no official proclamation as to which of these traditions is to be held authentic. And the church, of course, there are uh, papal documents written about the Assumption of Mary, but we do not know exactly from which location. However, the dogma of the her Assumption is, is what we are called to believe as truth, that she was assumed body and soul into heaven. What about us? Why not have a little house of Mary in our home? Now, what do I mean by that? <laughs> we can have a special place in our home dedicated to Mary, an icon of Mary or an image of your choice. Remember uh, hearing about the icon located inside her, her house? Uh, this can become a, like a prayer space in your home dedicated to Mary. What would we want to do um, with this? Well, why would we want to do this? Well, it's a, it's a sign of our love for her, a sign of our faith in God, but it's also to attract us to think about God and, of course, being reminded of Mary's love for us. It's a reminder that God is with us, and so is Mary, his mother, our mother. They are with us through our ups and downs through life. So what is needed to create this little house of Mary or this prayer space? Well, let's look at three, three, three elements, location, some, uh, the keeping it simple, and the items, the location. It could be a small shelf in a room, a corner table, a small table, a place where it's visible, where you see it daily. Um, keep it simple. Keep it focused and not cluttered. Focus on the reason of why you've built this little house for Mary, this sacred space. A reminder of its purpose, to draw attention to prayer, to be, to be reminded of Mary's presence in our lives, and items. Now, these could be your favorite religious uh, images. Remember, we talked about that image of Mary. 
how about an image of Mary? There's so many. There's so many faces of Mary, whether in the form of a statue, an icon, a traditional image, such as that of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Well, the image will remind you of Mary's love for you. And maybe, you know, I, I include a crucifix. Or it's a crucifix, a cross, a, it's a sign of Christ's love. It's a sign of victory over death and a reminder of how much Jesus loved us. Remember, Mary made her own stations of the cross outside her home. They weren't in the form of a cross, as we heard in Mary and Anne Catherine Emmerich's words. But again, it reminds us that Jesus carried his cross on Via de la Rosa in Jerusalem and laid his life on the cross, was crucified, and died for us. A rosary near her image as a reminder to pick it up and pray the rosary daily. The rosary, which consists of five decades of the gospel prayer called the Hail Mary, including the Lord's Prayer, uh, which is the Our Father, is a powerful prayer because it recalls scripture and it asks Mary to intercede for us now and at the hour of our own death. Who would not want the Mother of God to pray for them at every moment, especially at the hour of our death? I would. So pray the rosary. It only takes 20 minutes to pray the rosary. This can be your little home that you build for Mary in your own home. If you choose, add a prayer book or maybe the Sages of the Cross to remind you to pray this beautiful devotion. So Mary's, you know, Mary's the mother of God. She's the mother of all of us. She's our Heavenly Mother. And her many apparitions in Lourdes, Fatima, and others, she repeatedly said to pray, to go to her son, Jesus, who is our Savior. She told us, pray daily, to pray the rosary, to pray for the conversion of sinners. Sounds like a mother's concern for souls, doesn't it? And rightly so, and thankfully so, because she's concerned not only for others, for, for, for sinners, but for us as well. We're sinners. And so when we pray the Hail Mary, as I said earlier, and we ask her to pray for her now, us now, and at the hour of our death. I think that is so powerful. So this little house of Mary can be simple and sweet. It is our, it is for our mother. It is to honor her. And so once you have this little house for Mary, your prayer space, approach it daily, beginning of your day, or at the end of your day, or during the day, or during crisis, and or during times of joy. It's it's a uh, it's our, our gift to God and to Mary. Our time with God and His mother is a gift we can give them. And God wants to give us His graces. Mary wants to give us so much as well through her maternal mercy. You know, Pope Francis has some message of wisdom to share with us here. These are his words. Our life is made of time, and time is God's gift. And it is therefore important to make use of it by, by performing good and fruitful actions. Among the many things to do in our daily routine, one of the priorities should be reminding ourselves of our Creator who allows us to live, who loves us, who accompanies us on our journey. When I read that, I thought of this little house of Mary thinking, this is our gift to God to honor His mother, to honor our own Heavenly Mother, but to remind ourselves that our Creator and His mother wants to be with us loves us, and and wants to accompany us on our journey. So create your little house for Mary, a prayer space in your home. It will remind you that someone is looking upon you, loves you, and protects you. That someone is our patient and merciful Heavenly Father and His mother, Mary, who is our maternal mother, our, our Heavenly Mother, who wants to help us. You know, it's so interesting how... Uh, well, it's interesting how so much of the plan of God unfolds in mystery. The foundation of the house of Mary in Ephesus dates back to the first century, and yet it is only in recent history that it has become a place of devotion. And that is primarily because of the written works of a visionary, Blessed and Catherine Emmerich. 
that is a little bit of like our baptism. You know, most of us were baptized as babies, as children, and received the theological gifts of faith, hope, and charity, as well as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And those gifts may be may be lying dormant within us most of our lives until something happens to awaken within us the reality of the presence of God. But God has always been there with us, as He promised, even if He has been unnoticed. Because He has given us a free will, He waits for us to be awakened. He waits, and yet, if we prayerfully reflect on the journey of our life, we will begin to recognize the numerous opportunities we had to discover the reality of the presence of God. The accidents we almost had, the unexpected generosity of a stranger, the forgiveness of someone we hurt deeply, a terrible problem that somehow was resolved. The humility of God is beyond our understanding. He is so merciful. He loves us more than we love ourselves, and yet waits patiently for us to return His love. Mary, the mother of God, is anxious for that awakening to happen within us. The sooner we are awakened to the love and mercy of God, will the rest of our life find its purpose. It is for this reason that Mary has appeared through the centuries in almost every continent to encourage humanity to pray, make sacrifices on behalf of those who do not believe, so that the grace of God might awaken them to their dignity as children of God. I just recall a moment, just now I was, I'm recalling the prayer that Mary gave to the three little children in Fatima, Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia, as she appeared to them in Fatima. She, this prayer was, was given actually by the angel of peace, preparing the three little visionaries before Mary came to them. Uh, anyways, this was the prayer that the angel of, of peace taught the three visionaries to learn in preparation for Mary's visit to them. It is, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love Thee. I pray for those, O Lord, who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love Thee. That covers quite a lot, and it's a simple prayer that the children memorized and prayed often throughout the day, every day. And so, it is uh, for this reason that Mary has appeared through the centuries, asking us to pray, giving us uh, reminders of her love, but most of all, the mercy of her son Jesus. His mercy is beyond um, our comprehension. So don't be afraid to run to Mary. St. John Vianney, a parish priest who lived in the 19th century in France, would often tell his parishioners, you can never love Mary more than Jesus loved her. Because so many people would say, well, if I go to Mary more than I do Jesus, or if I love her, I think I love Mary more than I do Jesus. We can never love more, Mary more than we do love Jesus. In other words, what St. John Vianney was saying, we can never love Mary more than Jesus loved her. So our, our love for Mary is really the fruit of our love for God. When we pray to Mary, ask her intercession, run to her as we would our own mother. She is there to receive us no matter who we are and what we have done. When Mary appeared to Catherine uh, Labore in Paris in 1830 and gave her the gift of the miraculous medal to give to the world, I, went, um, I remember that I read the story, and, and Sister Catherine, when she first saw Mary, Mary was sitting on a, on a chair in the chapel. So she knelt and placed her head on Mary's lap. Sometimes I, I think of that image when I go to Mary. I, I, you know, of course, we don't have her physical lap to place our head on, don't we wish we would? But we, we have in our heart that image that we can place our head on the heart of, of our Blessed Mother, on her, on her shoulder, on her lap, as a child does to a mother, and just be you know, be with her. Imagine that image in your mind when you go to her. She welcomes us to have those kind of images because she is our, mater- our our merciful mother. Well, I just want to thank you for joining me on Journeys of Hope. My husband is usually with us, but he, but he was called away on some diaconate duties right before our program. And so duty calls. And well, here I was to tell you about Ephesus. And I was so happy to do so because I really myself love Mary so much and have a great devotion to her as well. We're just about out of time for today's episode of Journeys of Hope, as is our tradition before we go to, we want to give you a jewel for the journey, a spiritual gem from scripture or from a saint or pope you can reflect on throughout the week. 
Well, today's jewel is from St. Francis de Sales, and these are his words to us. Let us run to Mary, and as little children, cast ourselves into her arms with a perfect confidence. You can find our jewel uh, for the journey on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. And before we close the prayer, I just wanted to add a little bit of information about and Catherine Emmerich. Uh, she has an amazing story, but just very briefly here in a couple of minutes, I just want to introduce you to her a bit more. She was born in Germany in 1774 and died in 1824. She was only 50 years old when she died. Well, after her death, they had found her body, after so many years, they found her body incorrupt, and her body is now entombed in a church in, in uh, Dulman, Germany. Pope John Paul II beatified her in July 2003. But she, you know, she was born uh, poor, um, to a poor, pious peasant family. She was a very pious child who suffered poor health, but who received visions and prophecies at a young age, she thought they were so common as children to see the child Jesus and the souls in purgatory. She was able to diagnose illness and recommend cures and to see a person's sins. She worked on her family's uh, area of farms, and she also worked as a seamstress and as a servant. She did enter the Augustinian convent in Germany. Although her health was poor, her enthusiasm for the religious life was, was great. The, the sisters really loved her, and she loved her religious life. Uh, she was uh, having religious ecstasies in the church, in her cell, and even while she worked. The convent was closed by the government order by a government order in Germany in 1812, and Anne had to move in with a poor widow. Her her health failed, and instead of working as a servant, a, a year later she became a patient. So her visions and prophesies uh, pro, sorry her visions increased, and later that year she received a stigmata with wounds on her hands and her feet, her head from the crown of thorns, and the gift of li living off nothing but Holy Communion, the Eucharist, for the rest of her life. So she didn't take any food, nothing but Holy Communion for the rest of her life. She tried to hide the wounds, but the word got out, and her vicar general instituted a, a lengthy and detailed investigation, and it was determined to be truly authentic, genuine. Uh, the poet Clemens Brentano visited Anne. She told him that she had seen him in a vision and that he was to make a written record of the revelations that she received. So he did. He made. He wrote all of her messages and her visions, and it was uh, later that this were published. It is around 1833. They were published, and today they're in a book form, and they can be found. It is called The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to the Meditations of Anne Catherine Emmerich, and then uh, also The Life of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the, the third volume, there are three volumes, The Life of Our Lord. And Catherine Emmerich, pray for us. She is blessed, and she is uh, one who gave, who saw the house of Mary in Ephesus and her visions. And thank God for that, because today we have her home we can visit. Thank you again for, for joining me on Journeys of Hope. And we invite you to visit us at Pilgrim Center of Hope on our website. We learn about our threefold ministry of pilgrimages, conferences, and evangelization outreach. And that website, again, is pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Uh, or call us, 210-521-3377. Because we are a pilgrim people, strive to live your journey of hope with boldness, passion, and joy. Until next time, may the Lord bless you. of Hope, a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Visit our website at pilgrimcenterofhope.org.